basically, there's a long history of both oppression and uh, resistance to uh, and uh, uh, and resistance to oppression. And within those uh, within those battles, there have always been arguments about the best way um, about the best way forward. And this long history uh, really has led a lot of people to say. Uh, uh, you know, whether we go through the women's suffrage movement, through to the Me Too movement, uh, through to the current uh, arguments, uh, 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 struggles we've seen around the question of abortion rights, where we've had some fantastic victories in Ireland, and yet at the same time in America, you see the very real threat of, uh, those, of, of those rights that have been won in the past being rolled back, something that is also happening in some of the countries, particularly in Eastern Europe, with the rise of the far right and so on. If you look at the campaigns around racism, back to the campaigns against slavery, um, through to the civil rights movement, through to the Black, right, through to the Black Lives Matter movement. If you look at the question of, gay, uh, 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 of, uh, of LGBT rights from the, uh, from the Stonewall riots through to the fights over Section 28 when the Thatcher government tried to effectively ban the discussion of, uh, 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 of homosexuality in schools through to the fight for uh, uh, rights for transgender people today. You see all of these struggles, and then you see that none of them have really broken through, that some of them have made important advances, and it's really important that we, that we celebrate those advances and those gains. But at the end of the day, a lot of people are still saying, if you look at some of the protests, you know these nice little homemade placards on a lot of the protests now, a lot of people are holding up banners saying, why am I still protesting this shit? And I think there is an overwhelming feeling about that, isn't there, that time after time, we come out and we fight and we make a little gain and then we find that we're having to fight the same old battles all over again. And therefore, we have to look, I think, quite carefully at the politics within those movements to try and unpick that and see what we really think is going to be um, uh, what we think is going to be the most effective way to fight, you see, because it's not true that all women or all black people or all LGBT people actually have the same understanding of where their oppression comes from and of the, um, 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 of the best way to fight it. And this has always been the case. It was the case within the um, suffragettes movement where initially everybody was united, fighting for the vote. Along came the First World War, actually split most fundamentally down class lines, but along whether or not you were going to support the war and what your attitude was and so on and so forth. A split within the movement uh, between essentially the, the bourgeois feminists and the, and the women who were looking more towards uh, the working class. In the black power struggles, you know, the initial uprising that really looked like it was going to challenge the system that then eventually uh, became uh, something that was based around identity politics or around the idea of getting black people into certain positions. You know, I think the idea that you can have a black president, which everybody, I'm sure, you know, celebrated in many ways as a symbol of things that might be changing, to then find out that a black president cannot stop the New York police slaughtering and killing black, or any other police inside America, slaughtering and killing black people. You have to say to yourself, there's a problem here with that as a kind of, um, with, the, with, the, with that as a strategy um, for trying to fight. And although on the, when, when movements are on the up, these differences can matter less. But when the movements start to go into retreat, these differences matter. And I think that one of the th good things that's happened is that as after, pe you know, after the uh, retreat of a lot of the high points of the movements in the late 60s, early 70s and so on, that throughout the 80s and early part of the 1990s, a lot of people did retreat into very inward-looking politics based around identity. And then what happened with the anti-globalization protests of the late 1990s and so on, people started to look for solutions that tried to connect the different oppressions together. And I think that's a good thing. I think that's a forward-looking thing. And I think the renewed interest in things like intersectionality theory, which actually was uh, you know, initially written about um, earlier, um, uh, but suddenly became extremely popular, you know, because people wanted to, you know, quite naturally begin to think about how do these different oppressions link together? How do we, um, how do we show solidarity and so on? And, and, and privilege theory as well, although in many ways that's more of a rehash of many old arguments about who really benefits from oppression and so on. But nevertheless, you can understand the renewed interest in it, can't you? When you've got somebody like Donald Trump who thinks it's all right to talk about uh, grabbing women's pussies and so on. Do you know what I mean? To actually say, check your privilege actually becomes quite a reasonable response. You've got people like Jordan Peterson in America. I don't know if people have come across this guy. He seems to be getting quite popular in the media at the moment. Absolutely disgusting. And he makes a speech about um, the Marxist lie of white privilege. You know, I think check your privilege is a reasonable response to people like that in that situation. So you can see why some of these theories have begun to become quite popular. People are getting a renewed interest in them. And, uh, you know, I think in general, 
that is a, a, you know, a good thing that people are looking towards those things. So I'm going to try and briefly go through intersectionality and privilege theory uh, um, and, 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 and look at what they are, but also look at what I think the weaknesses are within them. Because the crucial question we have to ask at the end of the day, isn't it, is are these theories really up to the job for uh, uh, bringing about an end to uh, for bringing about an end to oppression. Now, intersectionality itself really arose within Black feminism in America. Um, the, per the person who coined the phrase was um, uh, um, was 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 Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989. Although people will often go back further and refer to the writings of the Combahee River Collective in 19 uh, in, in 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 1977 that talked about a system of uh, um, um, of interlocking oppressions. Now, what Kimberly Crenshaw was specifically looking at was she was involved in representing black women in industrial tribunals. And what she realized was that institutionally, where you had the double oppression of black women, actually, you could try and take it on as a question of racism, but they'd go, oh, but we're not racist. Look at these black men that we don't discriminate against. Or you could take it on as a question of sexism, and then they go, oh, but we're not sexist. Look at these white women that we haven't discriminated against. And therefore, what she argued was that there is, that when you, when you add together the two oppressions, it's not a simple additive sum. It actually creates a unique oppression, which institutionally is not catered for within the system, and therefore adds, to, and therefore makes your discrimination different, if you like. It's quite interesting, actually. Some of the stuff she wrote about that, she wrote some similar stuff about the legal system in terms of domestic violence when it came to the question of immigrant and black women. And I think a lot of this writing is really, you know, is, is, is really interesting, but she's writing about something that is very specific in terms of um, uh, uh, institutionally taking up, um, uh, taking up cases on behalf of people. And she herself said that it's not a new totalizing um, theory of identity. And she said that she has been amazed at how intersectionality gets over and underused. Sometimes I can't even recognize it in the literature anymore. Now, of course, she's an academic, and if you get a whole branch of academia named after you, you might be amazed at how it's been taken up and overused, but actually you're not really going to challenge it. I'm, I have no problem with that. She is perfectly entitled to set up and have a career in academia. That's, that's fine. Um, but the reality is it has become this unchallenged, overarching theory um, that a lot of people um, that a lot of people uh, look to. But, um, people like um, Patricia Hill Collins that some people have made of, I think, have really um, tried to do that. So Patricia Hill Collins talks about how we need new categories of analysis, inclusive of race, class, and gender, as distinctive yet interlocking um, systems of oppression. And again, again, it's you know something that is more than the sum of the parts. If you uh, if you suffer from one oppression, that there's not a hierarchy between race, class, and gender. These are all treated as equal, but when they come together and it, it, uh, uh, intersect, they become uh, more than some of their, their, their parts. And she talks about structures being based on um, fundamental um, relations of domination and subordination. And within that, and, I, and I, I think that's quite telling because those fundamental relations can exist along any of these interlocking branches. And within that, she talks about systems of domination and subordination. In other words, within each oppression, um, uh, uh, white people are dominant, black people are subordinate. Uh, men are dominant, women are subordinate, and so on. And there's no differentiation there between the different categories in terms of, uh, uh, in, in terms of who is... Uh, in terms of who is dominant in that situation. Anybody can be an oppressor and oppressed. Patricia Hill Collins, uh, one, of her, one of her most famous articles around it, starts with a quote from Audre, uh, 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 Andre Lord that says that we've all got to look for the oppressor within us. Um, and it's, it becomes um, actually fundamentally a call to people to change their own um, personal behavior. There's no real explanation about where these... Uh, different oppressions come from, about how they can be challenged uh, 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 in terms of challenging the whole system, it becomes something where you look uh, 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 to, you fundamentally the task becomes to, uh, the, cast, the, the task becomes to change uh, 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 your behavior, and that become, can become quite an appealing thing, can't it, really? If you've grown up experiencing sexism, racism, homophobia, etc., you know, the idea that people should really um, question what they're doing themselves and start to change their behavior around it is quite right, actually. It's absolutely right. Um, uh, 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 but the, the problem is it then actually in the absence, especially in the absence of real collective struggle, where there's no, you know, where's the alternative to this then? Where are we going to actually change the system? People can't see it. Um, you can understand why these theories become really quite popular, but it's come to the extent 
that his, it has become um, a buzzword almost, you know, that you can just say, oh, well, you're not being intersectional. And I think this covers up a whole number of problems and actually avoids a whole number of political discussions. And it also means that it becomes open up to anyone to use. So um, Hillary Clinton, for example, um, uh, was tweeting, amongst other things, uh, in the uh, uh, during the election ca uh, uh, campaign, she um, thought that she would uh, jump on the bandwagon and she said, Flint's water crisis is an example of the combined effects of intersecting issues that impact uh, communities of color. Uh, we face, and then she goes, we face a complex intersectional set of challenges. We need solutions and real plans for all of them. And then she sends out this diagram that's got um, all these lines going off it saying things like accountable leadership, good public schools, investments in communities of color, so on and so forth. And this has been described by one activist as a hairball. You know, it's just this mess with all these labels on it that actually means nothing in terms of actually how you fight and what you're, uh, 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 what you're going to do. And I think that this is part of the problem with intersectionality. A lot of people just say, well, I don't really know what it means. And, you know, and I think, you know, to come back to what Kim Kimberly Crenshaw said, she was, as I said, she was looking at something that was really um, quite specific and it's become something that's become um, quite a general theory and therefore means all things to all people. Now, I think that for a lot of new activists coming into politics for the first time, intersectionality can be an extremely positive thing. It can take you away from the inward lookingness that, 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 and the moralism that affected a lot of identity politics throughout the uh, 1980s and 1990s. But really, I think to most people in that situation, what it really means is inclusivity and solidarity. I want to show solidarity with everybody who's oppressed. I want all of our uh, meetings, the way that we organize and, uh, and fight back and so on, to be inclusive of all the different oppressions, that's obviously a good thing. But it's not actually unique to intersectional theory. Um, you know, I, 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 um, but it is a good thing. If people are coming into politics for the first time and that is, it's leading them to, 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 to those kinds of understandings, um, um, then, I think that's a, then, I, then I think that's a good thing. But the problem is that to the theorists, the people who actually make a living pumping this stuff out in academia, it actually means something different from that. It actually is about a strategy that is based on, um, that is based on, um, uh, uh, that, 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 that is based on, on, on personal change and that has a complete lack of explanation about why you might be oppressed in the first place and, uh, and where these different vectors, you often hear uh, intersectionality theorists talk about vectors. There's, there's one coming in here, there's one going over there, there's one going over there and they kind of intersect in all these places. There's no explanation of where those vectors come from in the, uh, 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 in the first place. So you often get good descriptions, very good descriptions about how oppression affects people and how multiple effects, uh, um, um, uh, uh, oppressions affect people, but you get but you get a complete absence of an explanation of why that um, 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 of why that should be happening. And as I said, even the best insights really around intersectionality theory aren't unique to intersectionality theory. If you think about the question, for example, of Muslim women, you know, Muslim women at the moment are arguably really at the sharp end of oppression in Britain. Uh, the most visible. Um, uh, uh, you know, form of, uh, of oppressed people, you know, the uh, easy pickings for racists who want to attack uh, women for wearing the hijab in public and spitting at them and so on and, and, uh, um, and so on and so forth. But actually, if you, th if you, for those of you who remember and for those of you who don't, it's important to know, at the, when, uh, when, the, when the movement against the Iraq war was at its height in 1993, um, there was mass movements building up and because of the nature of the war, um, a big part of that was actually working with Muslim groups. And these questions were debated and argued out with. Some people on the left didn't work, want to work with Muslim groups because they thought that they oppressed women. And we had to have the argument. They thought that people wearing um, hijabs and burqas and so on was a sign of oppression and this isn't something that we should be part of. And we had to have an argument within the movement about it. And we actually won that argument because we said that actually a victory for the anti-war movement is a victory for everybody everywhere and we're against all oppression and we're for women's right to choose as much as their reproductive rights, what they want to wear, uh, uh, um, how they want to celebrate their faith and so on and so forth. And, and, and we actually won that argument in Britain and as a, as, a, as a result of that, we put on the streets the biggest mass demonstration that has ever happened in Britain. And that was a movement that was led by Marxists actually. It didn't come from sitting around and going, oh, I wonder how 
all of their different oppressions intersect. Actually, nobody was talking about intersectionality then. It came from standing with solidarity with the oppressed and building a united movement and building a united movement against the war. And actually, these things do come down to um, 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 a question of politics. You see, Kimberly Crenshaw likes to talk about a failure of intersectionality. So she'll talk about, for example, the Black Lives Matter movement and say, well, the Black Lives Matter movement was really just about black men being killed, and it ignored what was happening to black women. And, this, and out of this came the Say Her Name thing about deaths of black women in custody and so on. And, um, and she calls it a failure of sectionality. Um, I, you know, and I think it avoids an argument about actually politics within the movement, and also about how fighting on one thing can raise the other thing. So the fact that people were out on the streets over Black Lives Matter actually then meant that people also took up the cases around um, black women in prison and so on and so forth. So, you know, rather than starting with a critique of the left, which a lot of intersectionality does, to start with standing with the oppressed and looking at how fighting on one issue can encourage and inspire people to fight on other issues as well, I think is, um, 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 I think is a much better way forward. Be and these things matter because in France, that argument about the hijab and Muslim women was lost actually. And the dominant argument was, we are going to side with the French government and ban the wearing of the hijab in public. Who do you think benefited from that? The Front National. Um, and, 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 and that was terrible. And the French left is still trying to recover from that now in terms of how it's grappling with the rise of fascism in France. So these arguments, um, so these arguments matter. And I think that uh, one of the things that it tells us is that the, the, the position of unconditional standing and unconditional solidarity with the oppressed, I think, is a, um, uh, um, a better position uh, 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 and, and helps us to go forward than um, uh, the more in, in, uh, uh, inward-looking uh, um, position of, of, of intersectionality. And it's a position that flows from, an under, from, from, from um, uh, understanding the uh, centrality of class in society. I'll come back to talk about that at the end. But it flows from that because we refuse to accept divisions uh, uh, within the class that will weaken us. But before that, I just want to talk a little bit about privilege theory because there's a big connection between um, privilege theory and uh, intersectionality. Although privilege, I think, is, as I said, is a, a rehash of a lot older arguments that were going on before. But um, So, for example, Patricia Hill Collins, uh, writing about intersectionality, says... Um, uh, once we realize that there are few pure victims or oppressors and that each one of us derives varying amounts of penalty and privilege from the multiple systems of oppression that frame our lives, then we will, then we will be in a position to see the need for new ways of thought and action. Um, so, you know, there's a connection there between the question of intersectionality and the, uh, um, and the, uh, um, and, and, and the question of privilege. Um, I guess the person who is probably most associated with privilege theory in terms of academia is uh, Peggy McIntosh who, uh, who, who wrote about uh, the system of unearned, um, un unearned benefits that many people are unaware of. She talked about it as how she as a white person carried around this knapsack with her that gave her all of these tools that enabled her to negotiate uh, in society in the way that somebody um, who, who, um, um, who was not white, um, who was not white wouldn't and she talks about how you know these these advanced the, the the this knapsack that you carry around and all of these tools that you've got and these privileges that you've got are often um, not only are they unearned but they're obviously often something that the person might not be conscious of and therefore the solution becomes really to make the privilege visible to uh, it's, it, 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 essentially it's a it, it becomes a form of consciousness raising very similar to um, the intersectionality theory that the conclusion the logical conclusion comes to be looking in towards yourself, which I have no objection to people doing. Obviously, I think people should challenge racism and sexism, but I think that those things should be called out for what they are rather than come up with theories that actually um, avoid that. So she says, um, I have come to see white privilege as an invisible package of unearned assets that I can count on cashing in each day, but about which I was meant to remain oblivious. White privilege is like an invisible weightless knapsack of special provisions, assurances, tools, maps, guides, code books, passports, visas, um, blah, 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 blah. Um, uh, you know, uh, she goes on to list about 46 ways in which she thinks that um, uh, 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 um, uh, white, white privilege benefits her um, in that way. And in many ways, of course, this fits with the common sense of society, doesn't it? Because if you're a young woman, you go out in the street. Who is it who's harassing you? Who is it who's making your life uncomfortable? Actually, it's a man. You know, if you're, if you're somebody who is, who, who is, who is, who is suffering from 
uh, racism at work or in the street and so on. Who is it who's doing to you that to you? It's a white person, and therefore that it kind of it very much fits with um, people's everyday experiences. And you know, once again, the desire to stand up and fight against that is obviously an important thing. It's an important motor in terms of how people start to rebel, to resist, to start to engage in um, 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 to start to uh, engage in, in, in struggle and so on. Unlike intersectionality theory, actually, privilege theory in its modern form does have some explanation. They do attempt some explanation of where it comes from. So they do talk about um, uh, um, the family, for example. They do talk about uh, the roots of, 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 of racism in slavery. But the, the problem is it then becomes... Um, uh, you know, so the whole uh, whiteness theory that David Rodiger writes about and so on. But it, it, then it, it, it becomes an explanation of where this oppression came from, but that it is now, now so deeply entrenched in people that really you can't break from it. So you can't break from your own racism, sexism, um, uh, um, um, hom hom homophobia and so on. And therefore, it becomes very pessimistic um, about the struggle. Just to quote a couple of things from Peggy McIntosh again. Um, uh, she says, such, uh, such privilege simply confers dominance, gives permission to control because of one's race or sex. And uh, uh, another person, Francis Kendall, says, any of us who has race privilege, which all white people do, and therefore the power to put our prejudices into law, not quite sure that all, 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 all white people have the power to put things into law, um, is, is, is racist by definition because we benefit from a racist system. So it's extremely pessimistic about the prospects of people breaking with racism or sexism and about, uh, you know, never mind about um, how we uh, get, rid, get, rid, get, 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 uh, uh, get rid of oppression and change society for good uh, uh, um, uh, and so on. And therefore, again, it becomes a question of conscious raising, hence the term, um, hence the term um, check, your, um, check, your, check, check, check your privilege. I think we have to question this issue of power and where power lies inside society and who really has and who really has the power in society? Who really has the power to give people jobs or not give people jobs? Or to decide how much, or to decide how much people get paid? Or to implement Section 28 in the way that I talked about? Who actually has, who actually has the power to, uh, uh, who actually has, um, um, has the power to do that? Who's going to decide whether we spend the money for services on disabled people or whether we spend the money on Trident? If you start to think in terms of who is it who can grant those privileges to you in the first place, you start to think about where real power lies in society. And I think that has to lead, then lead you towards um, the question of class. I mean, even in terms of the whiteness um, theory and David Rodiger, there's another uh, black Marxist called Dubois who actually talked about how this theory, uh, the, 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 the kind of buying off, if you like, of the white working class with better jobs and better salaries uh, 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 in order to entrench racism in society. Now, he talks about how this was a deliberate strategy of the ruling class. And actually, if you look at... Um, uh, there's a, there, has been, there was a very good survey done about the wage differences between black and white workers in different states in, uh, in, 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 in America. And what they found was that where you had the most discrimination, the most segregation, actually not only were the wages of black workers lower, but the wages of white workers were lower as well. And that where you had more integration and, uh, 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 and less racism, actually the wages of both black and white workers, even for white workers relatively, did not benefit them to have a higher level of, um, of, of racism within society. And I think that's, I think that's very... That, I think that's, um, um, and I think that's very important when we come to talk about where power really lies in, uh, in society and so on. And I think that what both of these theories do, intersectionality and privilege theory, is that they come out of a particular period. I talked about the decline of the high points of the movements after the late 60s and 70s and going into the 80s and 90s, and it became fashionable then. After you'd gone from, particularly in Britain actually, there was a much higher level of class struggle associated with, uh, with these struggles, and the demands within the women's movement were much more based around actually working class issues, demands for 24-hour childcare, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, um, uh, um, but, but what arose out of the decline of those movements was a turn away from uh, looking at Marx in terms of this grand theory of the working class versus the ruling class, what people call the grand narrative, and towards what people call post-Marxism or post-structuralism, where, where really there's, you can't really talk about um, uh, this 
uh, where uh, power residing with one class within society. Uh, you know, um, Michel Foucault, who is one of the key proponents of these sorts of ideas, talked about power existing everywhere. So again, you're back to looking within those little interactions between individuals and who has the power in this situation and who doesn't. And you move away from that overarching, um, um, from that overarching um, narrative. And I think that that is, uh, you know, and you end up with just little battles between um, oppressed and oppressors. And I think that's a problem. And I want to just fin uh, start to finish, really, by talking about um, uh, why I think we need to restate the centrality of Marxism and of class within this. Because I think that one of the biggest problems is talking about the uh, uh, race, class, gender, you know, you get this kind of, um, you know, holy trinity, um, as being things that are of, not, not so much of equal weight, but of, you know, open to the same kind of type of analysis and so on and so forth. And you see, there's often when people want to reject that, what they do is they, they, they build up a kind of false image of what Marxism is really about and what Marxists mean by, uh, um, and what Marxists mean by the important by, by the centrality of class. It's not that we mean that class is more important than anything else. That's, you know, you just need to take one look at the history of the radical left in various struggles. You know, I'm sure, uh, you know, people here have probably got experiences of it or can talk about it from the floor. But just in terms of the practice of the left over a long period of time, this is fundamentally, um, this is fundamentally not true. But what class does that, that is different is that it enables us to explain where the oppression comes from. Because what Marx said about class is that the working class are exploited. In other words, those that have to sell their labor power for a living, are, it, it is the, it, it's the squeezing of the profits out of those workers by the ruling class that is, that, 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 that is the key to how society works. And, and, that also ex and the battles between those classes um, explain the developments and how society changes and so on. And that begins to give you an analysis that is not static, but that looks at how ideas can change, that can look at how the family developed at a particular point in history, which Engels talks about in his, in his book, The Origins of the Family, Private Property and the State, but also how that family then changes over the centuries and becomes the sort of, the sort of family that we have now. How racism can develop in the context of slavery, but actually can then become the anti-immigration rhetoric that we get today. It's uh, looking, at, looking at the needs of the, of, the, of, the, of the ruling class and the struggles that inevitably follow them because the working class have completely opposite it needs, the needs that inevitably, the struggles that inevitably follow then, enable us to build up a bit of a, of a, of a more dynamic picture, if you like, of how oppression arises in the first place, how, how oppression can change, and therefore how also people's ideas can change, which is another fundamental point of Marxism, which I'll, which I'll, um, 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 I'll, 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 co I'll come back to in a minute. Because I think the problem is that then, you then get, and that's different from oppression, institutionalized oppression of particular groups of workers that then has the effect of, uh, 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 of dividing the working class and of, uh, 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 and of making it harder for us to fight back. Hence, the, you know, the attempts to buy off the white working class in America and so on and so forth. These are deliberate strategies that are designed, you know, the, the, the stereotyping around the family that then enables people to pay women less because your real role is to be the homemaker, look after the kids and so on. You're, you know, you're not really, you know, it's the man's wage that's important and so on. So a number of these things then flow from that, from, um, from those battles. And the other thing that happens is that you get from the intersectionality theorists and the privilege theorists this kind of... Um, they, ironically, for something that started off talking about black feminism, they actually end up writing out of history, to be honest with you, a number of black women, because their understanding of Marx is that we're only interested in horny-handed sons of toil, you know, who are all white men with cloth caps and so on. Actually, you look, for example, at the Communist Party tradition in America, you talk about why did so many black women join it? Claudia Jones, who en ended up coming over to Britain and founding the Notting Hill Carnival. Rosa Parks, by the way, wasn't just a tired woman sitting on a bus. She was a member of the Communist Party. She was steeped in a tradition of radical struggle and Marxism. These, you know, you know, and, and this is, this is you know, not mentioned by, by, um, uh, uh, by, by, by people who talk about, um, 
who talk about intersectionality and privilege theory, they often start from the position of criticising the left. And I think that's... Uh, there are lots of things I could criticise the Communist Party for, to be honest. Unfortunately, it's, its particular form of Marxism was very influenced by what was happening with Stalin and Russia and, in Russia and so on and so forth, and therefore... Um, you know, had a whole number of problems of its own, but they did attempt to organise around women's issues amongst immigrant workers and and uh, uh, um, um, and uh, and so on and so forth. And you often get, you know, the women's liberation movement of the 70s dismissed as just being about white middle class women. There was a problem with white middle class women, particularly in the American movement. As I said, the British movement was a little was 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 uh, was, um, uh, was a little bit different. But it's not true, actually, that they did that they completely ignored the question of race. It's not true. M most of the people, the early people, and Lisa Vogel writes quite well about this, actually, um, um, that, start, that started their political activity in the civil rights movement. Um, you know, again, I'm, you know, there, there are, there are there, you know, there, there are problems that develop, there are justified criticisms uh, uh, to be had, and, and, uh, and that's absolutely right. We should all look at what the problems are and debate and discuss them and so on, but we shouldn't dismiss some of the real gains that people who, uh, that, 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 that people who fought in the past, uh, it, it, people who fought in the past have made. So just a couple of, um, just a couple of quick points to, uh, to, f to, to, to finish. Um, it's, you know, what's happened now since, I think particularly since 2008 and the global crash and austerity and neoliberalism and so on, people are now starting to go back and look again at Marx, aren't they? And I think it's really important that we, uh, and, and interestingly, what's happening as part of that is that a number of, uh, 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 of feminist theorists and uh, uh, theorists in the anti-racist tradition are starting to question intersectionality and, 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 and itself because they're realizing that it doesn't really give us much of a, uh, a, a, a guidance in terms of how we can actually fight and change things. And people want to be more outward looking and people are starting to look back to Marx. And that's why, for example, um, th people are now starting to look to, to, for example, things like social reproduction theory. There's a meeting on that later. I don't want to go into it now. I do recommend that you go to it. I think it suffers from some of the same issues, some of the same problems. So I don't, you know, but I don't, I, obviously people can feel free to take it up in the, dis in, in, in the discussion. But the same problem in terms of what do we mean by class? How can we actually fight in terms of class? But it opens it up. What is happening now is an opening up of us to go back and have those arguments about uh, to restate the uh, Marxist reason for seeing class as central in fighting for a society free of oppression. So to quickly just run through why, because it's, it's, uh, it's an understanding of society that changes uh, uh, um, where, 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 the, where oppression operates in the interest and to the benefit of the tiny minority of rich people that run, um, that run society, that the working class is a class and uh, is a class that has not only a material interest in fighting oppression because oppression divides us but also has the power to do that as well the power to stop the railways to turn the lights off to stop people getting their um uh, 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 their mcdonald's and 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 uh, um and so on uh, uh, and so on and so forth and also that class shapes the way that oppression is experienced and therefore within any battle that takes place around the question of oppression um, those divisions will uh, um, will inevitably come to the fore. So the Gay Liberation Front that arose out of the Stonewall riots, which was fantastic, you're fighting the police on the streets, lots of um, uh, cross-dressing and transgender women involved in that, by the way, which later attempted to be written out of history, that actually what happened as they started to win gains for homosexuals inside America, when the, when the transgender community wanted to join the pride marches, they were told no. Why? Because it becomes that battle between are we fighting for a few reforms in society where we can just become a little bit more respectable, or are we, do, are we actually fighting to fundamentally tran uh, uh, transform the world? Again, you know, the women's liberation, uh, the fights over feminism. Is it, going to, is, it, is it a fight over whether you get a woman on a £10 note? Which I'm in favour of doing, by the way. I'm absolutely in favour of more uh, women in, 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 in public view, doing well, uh, being visible, etc., etc. All really good. But, uh, you know, these things then become, or it becomes about the glass ceiling. You know, we're talking about how many women are there in boards of financial companies when actually most people are really struggling to pay the rent every day. In other words, it's the, it's the glue on the floor they're stuck to, they're worried about. They're not worried about the glass ceiling for a few women. Um, um, uh, um, um, uh, and, uh, and, and so on. So these class will ultimately always end up uh, creating arguments and divisions inside movements based around oppression that will ultimately come down to the question of reform or revolution. 
What do we mean when we talk about class, just to finish? Because when people, again, this idea that class is only about white men. You go to almost any picket line now, and you will see women, you will see immigrant workers, and so on and so forth. The idea that people who work in the gig economy are outside the waged working class. I don't know if anybody heard the person, the McDonald's striker, talking in the opening rally. She was talking about people who have worked in McDonald's for 17 years. This, you know, it doesn't, just because you work in the fast food, my local Tesco, I've seen the same woman in there behind the counter for the last five years. These are, you know, these are, and, and by the way, Tesco's are one of the biggest employers in the country, and they're unionized, they're getting unionized. But, uh, these are people with a lot of, um, these are people with a lot of power. So we're talking about uh, a, um, a working class that when it fights, forces you to take on and challenge that question because you stand on the picket line. And one of the, the founder of the Socialist Workers Party, Tony Cliff, he talked about it like this, that when you're faced with racism, uh, suppose you're on a picket line and, uh, and somebody next to you, right, uh, some of you might not know what a picket line is. I'm looking at some young people here, right? This is when you think you go on strike, you stand there, you say, we're not going into work, we're closing down our workplace, and if you try and come into my workplace, we're going to link arms and try, we're gonna link arms and try, and, try uh, 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 and try and stop you. So you're standing there, and somebody makes a racist comment. And what you said was, there's three choices. One choice is, you turn around and you go, you're a racist. Maybe in today's language, you go, check your privilege or something like that, you know, or, or we're intersectional here, or, and they go, what? And, you know, uh, and you go and stand away from them, right? And then what happens? The scabs who are trying to break your strike bowl up and walk in between you, and your strike loses. The other one is to stand there, and they make a racist comment, and you look up at the sky, and you go, wonder if it's going to rain today. In other words, you completely ignore it. You try and avoid the question. The second one, the third one, is to say, oh, look, here's, a, here's somebody coming to try to break our strike. Let's link arms and stop them together. And when you stop them, you then turn around and say, your racist attitudes are going to weaken our strike. Our black brothers and sisters, our immigrant brothers and sisters, these are people that we are struggling with. And you need to decide whose side you're on because your attitude is benefiting our bosses and weakening us. And that is the strategy of revolutionary Marxism. And I think that is the strategy that we have to rediscover in the present period. Yeah, thank you. Can you, can you all hear me? No, a bit of shouting. At, uh, anyway, nice um, um, Sagan came from Leeds. Are we supposed to say that? Yeah, you can. Okay. <laughs> anyway, sorry. To go back, I've, I've always been quite uncomfortable with the privilege theory because I know there's a, a very, very good activist in Leeds, black woman, wonderful woman, but always on these demonstrations, that always says something about checking your privilege. And I'm just looking around going, hang on a minute, we're here united. That's not what we need you. That's not where we start from. And when Sue was talking, and I, I am going to do the age thing, is I'm going to tell you a little story because sometimes we forget what happens at the high points of class struggle, you know, because we haven't seen that much class struggle over the last few years. But I remember during the minor strike, I was a young student in Manchester, and um, a Manchester Poly, and we managed to get a motion to get or any, any, any striking minor a free accommodation and free food for as a duration of their lifetime. Anyway, we ended up one day organising delegation work. Now, this is where the times where there were factories in Manchester, folks, you know. There were real workplaces with real stewards. And I was in the, I was in the middle of the town centre with a group of four Yorkshire miners. And they said to me, ooh, we're following a woman, following a woman. What's all that about? And I went, look, you're not only following a woman, with a, with a, following a middle-class woman with a middle-class student with no sense of direction. Come on, I said, no sense of direction. If you don't shut, you shut up your sexism, I'm leaving you here in the rain. Do I make myself absolutely clear? And the lads went, yes, you make yourself absolutely clear. The following week, in, in Manchester Poly Students Union, there was 50 miners, the Yorkshire miners. There was a number of students. We had clipboards, and it was literally a, a military operation. It was like, you four, you're going with Christine. These are the workplaces you're going to. These are the students you're going to see. Off you go, and I'll see you back here at 5 o'clock. That's okay. And that was the way it changed. If I'd stood there in Manchester in the rain and said, 
check your privileges, lad, they'd have gone, what the fuck is she talking about? So I should remember what's she talking about? And I think that's, I mean, I, when, I, when I first started teaching, I started teaching at Leeds College Building. I was the only woman on the teaching staff. There was 84 men and me, and I was tiny. And it was a real battle. But if I'd start by saying, oh, my God, these people are all more privileged than I, I'd have never got anywhere. And it was literally about taking the sexism on and challenging and getting better people, better men, to start challenging the, the, the more sexist within that environment. So that's where, that's unfortunately, where, the, where that theory ends up. It doesn't end up with us being united. It ends up with where we're divided. Um, Sue and I were at a meeting in, in Hackney a while ago, a momentum meeting about trans rights, and one of the people in the room was uh, a young trans woman called Lily Madigan. She'd had the temerity to be elected as a women's officer and had therefore been the subject to a lot of transphobic abuse and bullying and general nastiness. And when we were in the workshop, she said, I feel privileged because I am white because most of the trans women who are murdered every year are black, and there's a huge number of. And in a sense, to me, that was the, the good side of privilege theory, in that it's an acknowledgement that other people have specific oppressions that they face, that you're not wallowing in your own victimhood, that you're recognising and trying to show solidarity with other people who are also suffering. But we, of course, said, you are not privileged because other people face racism. You have a common cause with those people, which you're expressing, despite the fact that you're suffering from quite a lot of nasty transphobic abuse, um, you're expressing that solidarity. And one thing that really annoys me is when people talk about the, the white working class, you know, now you go on picket lines, there are lots of women and black people. It was always so. Yeah. It was always so. And the Marxist tradition has nothing to be defensive about. The first country to um, abolish modern slavery was France after the revolution um, at, the end of the 19th, at the end of the 18th century. Toussaint Louverture's revolution in Haiti. His best general was Sanitaire Belair, a woman who is now on a Haitian banknote, talking of the banknotes again, but she was a revolutionary sort of insurrectionist against slavery. The 1848 revolution in France was led in part by a woman called Jeanne Durand, who produced a socialist feminist newspaper called The Voice of Women. And I'm raising it here because they sold, women sold it on the streets and there's this engraving of these women and they just look like socialist workers. <laughs> but with bonnets and crinolines and they're there with these sort of revolutionary slogans. She was one of the leaders in London. The, one of the greatest Chartist leaders in London was a black man, the son of slaves, William Cuffey. You know, and, and the point that uh, Marx said was the greatest achievement of the British working class was the support for the North in the American Civil War. There was a young black woman abolitionist who toured the Lancashire uh, textile field, Sarah, pa uh, Sarah Parker Redmond, and she was a young woman. Thousands and thousands of textile workers who'd been thrown out of work because of the Civil War cheered her to the rafters in towns like Warrington, around Manchester, all these areas where people were really suffering but had a principled solidarity with the question of um, the abolition of slavery and a support for a young black woman abolitionist. Thousands came to see her, hear her talk. You think, when I think about the Russian Revolution, I think of Alexandra Kolontai, I think of Eugenia Bosch, who was a, a Jewish woman and a military leader. When you think of the German Revolution of 1918, it's Rosa Luxemburg, it's Karl, uh, Clara Zetkin. Our tradition has a, a rich and fertile history of solidarity between men and women and across the races, but it's based on that profound struggle, not on sitting around checking our privilege. Although, you know, I'm not against people doing that if they feel the need. <laughs> Hi, comrades. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah bro, good. Uh, yeah, um, something I've noticed uh, particularly as I've gone through, um, uh, uh, just generally the people I know, um, uh, is just how much intersectionality uh, has also kind of taken over the tactics of a lot of not a lot of not just people not just people who are using purely that theory, but also revolutionaries as well. Um, you know, even people who are purporting to be socialists and often anarchists as well are still stuck in the particular tactics used by it, the check your privilege tactic and things like that. Um, and a lot of it, a lot of it comes um, from, uh, a lot of it comes from uh, these people being very broken down and, and, and their inability to actually strike. A lot of these people are also disabled as well. Um, they don't, they can't strike, they're not in work um, because they can't, they, they literally can't work. That's not a tactic, that's not a tactic that's quite, uh, quite as available to them. Um, 
and a lot of what a what, lot of what ends up happening is, is just does just evolve into criticism of a variety of leftist groups as well as other people and it it it, it comes down to a lack of detailing how to move forward for people uh, now some some people do put this down properly they say right okay if you want to if you if you could do this and this and this if you could admit you're wrong and if you could i don't know donate to a, donate to a charity or uh, you know small small gesture or you know change this rule of put your group and 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 deal with this person's behavior then Real, we could let you back in the movement. Sometimes you come across that, but very often we do not come across this, and it is so difficult to actually progress as a leftist movement when a lot of the tactics, are, a lot of the tactics that are used by by us because of, because of, because of privilege theory, essentially, it's essentially do amount to, as Sue said, just cut people out, and eventually you do end up with a tiny group, and that's why these groups are so tiny. Now I know a lot of comrades in this party, and some people have said transphobic shit to me. And that has been unpleasant. Yes, that has been unpleasant. But I don't immediately go, you're a turf, get the fuck out of my party. Unless, of course, they're literally physically attacking me or something. Um, it's sitting down with people and it's explaining and it's having those difficult conversations with people. Now, some people are not receptive to this and that is a problem as well. But it's still necessary and it's not going to happen overnight. And this is why I'm, it's, it's, it's why I'm also constantly worried about the fact that among the trans community specifically, uh, no platforming is being extended to turfs. Because, yeah, some of these people are not going to change their minds. You know, the, the, Kathy Brennan and, and Jermaine Greer, people like that, are not going to change their minds. They've been set in these ways for decades. People have already explained this to them. God only knows how many times. But the point is not to change those people's minds. It's not to change the figureheads. We're not going to do that. The point is to change the people around them. The, the point is to show them, the, show them what their leaders are like and what our politics are. And that when you just ban these people outright with the with, uh, uh, with, um, no platforming, it completely and utterly destroys the potential for that. And it's such a problem because, uh, like I said, I've had problems with people in the party, but I've spoken to them, and now some of the people who are in the party who've expressed these views before are now some of the strongest trans allies I have. And that is so that is so important. And so many, even revolutionary comrades that are now outside of the party... I just don't address, don't address this, and they're continuing on the on they're continuing to just not engage with these people. This is a massive failure, and we, the party, have to make make it so clear that we have to not ban these people, and that we do appreciate how violent they are, that they'll dox people, that they will be physically violent towards Next them. Yeah, I can wrap up. But the, <laughs> apologies, um, but but the, it, it's so necessary for us to just get out there and put forward the view that we must not ban these people. We have to engage, even if it's da- even if it is dangerous. If it was easy, everyone would be doing it. And, uh, but it is, it's dangerous, but it's got to be done. Right, is that is that working? Yeah. Is it now? Can you hear that? Yeah. Cool, all right. I think it just sort of turned itself off. There we go. Okay, I just wanted to talk about uh, privilege theory and actually how, how damaging sometimes it can be to the movement. I was contacted by a woman in Manchester who I've been trying to get involved in anti racism work. She's a youth worker in Moss Side. She's white. Uh, she's, her partner is black. She has three black stepchildren. Uh, and she contacted me. She she'd not really come to much stuff, but she contacted me and said, "Could I have a chat with you? Can we arrange to meet for a cup of tea?" So we met up, and she said to me she'd gone to a meeting, and when she went to the meeting, somebody at the door said to her, "We want to check your privilege before you come in." <laughs> and she sort of said, "I didn't know what that meant." And then someone explained to her that as a white woman, you're privileged and all the rest of it. And she was really traumatized. She said. So am I responsible for the racism that I know my three stepchildren are having to deal with? I mean, really, she was... And, you know, trying to explain to her that actually as individuals we don't benefit and actually it's a state and it's a, it's a you know, class and all the rest of it. She, it I mean, what... I mean, I, she said to me, OK, even if it was... A, I mean, even this privilege day was a thing, what would I do about it? Does that mean if I'm walking around in a room and as a white activist, I don't have the right to speak? You know, is it? You know, and how do you build solidarity on that basis? And I think the problem with privilege theory very often is that people that are talking about it aren't actually involved in the movement, because you're, if you're actually involved in the struggle, you start identifying that actually we're all standing together, exactly on a picket line. I mean, I don't I can't imagine anybody in a picket line. We just had the Wigan strikers, health workers on strike. I mean, I can't imagine any of those black workers starting with, "Can you check your privilege before you stand in solidarity next to me?" Or on an anti-racist demonstration when I'm standing arm in arm, what are we going to say? I'm sorry, you're, you're privileged. You stand at the back. 
because I've got a load of fascist marching up to me and I want to stand here with black people who recognise the same struggles and, and identify with me. I just... I, I, I mean, I've read so much about it, and I'm really struggling because all I see is it's a race to the bottom. This idea, actually, I don't think it's a privilege that as white people you don't have to deal with racism because I think, actually, I don't think anyone in society to deal with racism or sexism or anything else. So this idea that actually you're privileged is actually offensive to the rest of it because it's not a privilege not to have to deal with racism. It's not a privilege not to have to deal with sexism or homophobia. It's a right, and therefore I, ex- I, I refuse to accept this idea that there is... You know, privilege sharing has any real basis because it's not a privilege and I'm not going to fight a race of the bomb. Okay. Um, I have to say, Donald Trump is a bit multi-billionaire. If there's anybody who should check their privilege, it's probably Donald Trump, or at least I would say that um, if, if I didn't have some other plans for him, actually. Um, you know, never mind, start just telling him to check his privilege. Um, let's do some other things about that. However, I think that the, um, the, the part that what lies behind some of these ideas about intersectionality and privilege theory is, an, is the idea that there are all sorts of different sites of power in society. And I think that as Marxists we say that's not really right, that we start from saying there are two sites of power in society, if you like. There is the power of the ruling class, which Donald Trump obviously absolutely exemplifies in a, quite a perfect way, perfect storm, isn't he? Uh, and the other site of power is, of course, us, the working class. And I think that it's interesting that um, when Sue talked about the, the development of the family under capitalism and the way capitalism has rebuilt the family to, to the image that it wants, um, I think that the root of all sorts of stereotypical ideas about what it is to be a man, what it is to be a woman, that, you know, that sort of, and also the sort of very binary idea about being men and women, is rooted in the social uh, ideological reality of the family under capitalism today that was developed in the late 19th century. And it's interesting to note that that happened uh, very specific, particularly in the wake of, in Britain at least, uh, in the wake of a defeat for the working class. Uh, the, the working class had fought absolutely valiantly throughout the first part of the 19th century, faced defeat by 1850 in terms of the struggle over the Chartism and so on. And therefore I think the idea... Uh, uh, that um, maybe it would help, you know, rather than have women giving birth in the factory and so on and so forth, the idea that, that the women perhaps should be at the, in, in the home uh, uh, and so on so had an appeal. It's, and, and we have to reject the idea this is some kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, unity between working class men and the, um, and the ruling class that had actually imposed that sort of form of sexism. So I think the key for us, therefore, is that um, the working class can be a unifying class. In fact, we are the universal class, and we have to be clear, you know, that actually, for instance, I as a woman, I face oppression. All women face oppression. But I'll tell you something, no one is going to make me unite with Amber Rudd, Theresa May, or Anne-Marie Bloody Waters. And so, therefore, we have to, therefore, for me, when I look round this room, and I, I see this is what the working class looks like, this is what working class leadership looks like, I have got far more in common with every, anybody here who is a man or identifies as a man than I have with anyone in the ruling class because at the end of it those women in the ruling class are oppressed but they also have a a class interest and that class interest is to divide the working class uh, in in the pursuit of their own rule. Because I think the the whole thing is about often a misunderstanding of what happens with class. I don't think anyone's yet mentioned in terms of the struggle and solidarity the match women's strike. Um, led by Annie Besson and um, Eleanor Marx, which started general trade unionism in this, you know, in, in Britain. Um, and I think it was one of the things that shows that there was not um, a division. And I think one of the things that happens now is that people forget what struggle was and what um, any kind of collectivity was. And I think that the things that we need to, to bring back is not just a uh, knowledge of our own history, but also uh, an awareness of how you change ideas. And I think that's one of the things that's come up with lots of the, the things that people have talked about in this, uh, uh, in this uh, session. But it's, it's both the fact that you, um, what we're talking about is a collective struggle rather than an individual thing. And what we're talking about um, is things that happen during struggle, because often people talk about these things as if 
it is just a thing that is a, a personal discussion that you have at, um, uh, at any time. And I think that one of the problems that comes out of the way things talk, I'm glad the, uh, the previous speaker talked about the binary that comes up. You have a, a thing where you have people talk about all sorts of, there's enormous, complex hierarchies of different oppressions. But actually what you tend to get is a seesaw. The idea that um, if uh, a white person is something improves for them, it means things are getting worse for black people. And if black people are going to have an improvement, it means things have got to get worse for all white people. And it becomes a, a strange way of looking at things where you're saying that in order for um, my life to improve, someone else, another working class person has got to get worse. And it does mean that you end up setting people against each other. And there's just a, a couple of recent examples. I'm talking about the the, the binary of who is who that really doesn't work. People might remember that when the, the, the strike, uh, the riots that started in 2011 after the uh, killing of Mark Duggan, um, there were some attempts in some of the early meetings to stop members of his family um, taking part in the, uh, in the protest because they were white, because as many inner city people, um, his relations and so on, a lot of them were from different backgrounds. You cannot simply divide people up and start saying um, there are white people over here who, who can fight, uh, who can't fight, and black people here who can fight, because in, uh, in the current society, it, things aren't, aren't divided that. And just the last example I would give is, uh, I think the, the dangers of uh, accepting any kind of privilege theory is... Uh, what happened, I don't know if people have heard about the arguments about Muslim Lives Matter. Um, in America, there was uh, an attempt to, after oppression of Muslims, to start up a Muslim Lives Matter um, hashtag, up, yeah. which was then attacked by uh, people, uh, actually a lot of um, people from black backgrounds, saying, no, this is our thing, this is our specific oppression. Uh, you, you can sort out your own way of dealing with oppression rather than having any idea of what the real history of all this is. It's about solidarity and how we have to work together. Right, next is you at the back in the red T-shirt. Yeah. And just to say, we've got a lot of people who've indicated to speak. I am going to try and get you all in, but if people could just try and keep it as succinct as possible. Yeah, you put your hand up, didn't you? I hope you did. <laughs> <laughs> Um, otherwise I'd really put you on the spot um. <laughs> right okay so uh, first of all um, I want to say that um, I'm going to use some of my uh, experiences during la my life and I don't want to get too personal but if I do I, ap I apologise so um, the, uh, uh, what they say is uh, you know a big misunderstanding of what what uh, for at least what have I seen as privilege all my life? Um, I am Spanish uh, and half Moroccan, and I grew up in Spain as a half Moroccan, half Spanish Muslim. But uh, I wasn't seen as a Spanish person. Um, therefore, uh, even though uh, you know I look white and I am white. I was treated uh, as uh, as an immigrant or as a not Spanish, and but at the same time, I had my brother next to me who I grew up with, and uh, his name is Elias, and he is black, and this I I I agree with you know the idea of privilege because I have experienced it because even though uh, I. I know um, the whole working class is oppressed. I, I think there are levels of oppression. And the, the reason why I think this is because I have seen you know, my brother having to worry about going to the beach in Spain and, and, and you know, getting beaten by a group of neo-Nazis. But uh, for me, I never had to worry about things like that, right? And, uh, and uh, this means that, you know, you grew up with uh, being black or any other kind of non-white mi minority in the Western world makes you grow up with, you know, experiences like that of, of fear to, to what people will say, tell you just for being, you know, not white. So the whole, uh, the whole privil privilege thing is often, you know, based in in how 
a lot of uh, sorry for you know if I offend someone saying this, but a lot of middle class white people talk about it without actually having the experience of of being racially oppressed. You know, uh, as I hear someone saying before, that's that's why some people. I do also believe that some people go further. Uh, Take it, take it more serious than it should be, you know, like with the, how you check your privilege. But you, you, uh, you do, you do, um, you do have to, you know, make sure you don't um, criticize w about a, a movement without having actual experience. You know, as I heard before, uh, it, uh, someone, s uh, you know, said something about a woman who was asked uh, she, to take her privilege because she was she was white. Come right, please, come up, please. Yes, sir. So the whole idea of, of you know being a middle class or, or working class a white person it doesn't make you you know worse or anything like that. But it does mean that you shouldn't you know you, you obviously can't give your opinion, but you shouldn't. You shouldn't uh, Bash uh, a movement of, of you know, of recognizing a uh, privilege mm -hmm. when when you haven't had to to go through that operation. Okay, so that's okay. okay next is you there with the bid. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, my name's James. I'm from Toronto. I'm in the International Socialists in Canada. And I think I have a more optimistic view on what uh, privilege theory or intersectionality represents for us as socialists and the movements. And I think about the, the best traditions of revolutionary socialism around being the tribune of the oppressed and trying to think about how privilege theory or intersectionality can be opportunities to engage in discussions about how all of us experience oppression in various different ways or we experience class in various different ways. And I think it's, there's nothing wrong with saying that even though we recognize that the primary division in society is that between the, the, organized, the, the overwhelming majority of the working class and the ruling class, there are divisions that exist within and among the working class, which means that working class people experience class and data and, and capitalism in very different ways. And I think it's really important for us to create opportunities for us to really hear what, what people are saying and what their experiences are and not to be so anxious about insisting on the primacy of class at the outset of the conversation because I feel like that can shut down the conversation that so many people are trying to have saying I just feel I experience day-to-day -day life differently than, than you might but it doesn't mean that you are my individual oppressor. I think the problem is if the conversation stops there or it's, it's situated at what can you do as an individual to try to get rid of these oppressions. I think there's lots of opportunities to go from from that discussion to talk about what are the collective solutions. If you think about capitalism as a racist, uh, homophobic, misogynist, uh, transphobic, Islamophobic society, those ideas, we soak in them every day. We have to challenge them everywhere we see them, on the picket lines, in our day-to-day -day lives at work, or whatever. So when those opportunities come up, it's important to find occasions to be in solidarity with people who are identifying that and to think about how can we collectively challenge those experiences. And that includes what our practices are on the left and as revolutionaries. Two quick examples. At the Pride March in Toronto a couple of years ago, there was an intervention by Black Lives Matter Toronto that interrupted the Pride March for 40 minutes where mostly young, black, uh, queer and trans youth said, hold on a second, this is a militant march uh, for, for gay pride, for, for liberation, but there are police in the demonstration, there are uniformed police officers and police cruisers, and that, that community got a lot of shit because they said for 40 minutes we're going to protest this, and we think cops out of pride. If you want to come here in a non-uniformed way, that's fine, but the police should not be here. And a lot of white uh, queer activists are saying this is not the right time, this is not the right place, this is causing division, and they're saying, you know what, we experience the police different for, differently from you do. If we, feel un we can't come to the march when there's uniformed cops there because we deal with that shit all the time. So this is not actually a safe space for us and for us to raise this is not about checking privilege per se, it's, it's trying to draw attention to the different ways that we experience class and oppression. Last point I'll wrap up on, there were some really amazing experiences I think our organization, our traditions had around the anti-war movement and I think about the way we worked with the, the Muslim community in its organized way and how that transformed so many of our practices. In Toronto we would meet in the bar 
or we would make decisions in the bar afterwards. And this was like a normal thing that we did on the left, but a lot of allies in the Muslim community said, you know what, this is an inaccessible space for us. It's not about you white people are bad or non-Muslim people are bad. It's about how do we make our spaces more open, more inclusive, more, uh, more dynamic so that we can really, really unite and get rid of the structural barriers that are the fault of capitalism and not of individuals. Right. Okay, great. Look, thanks, uh, thanks very much, um, everybody. Um, I want to start, really, where I think the last speaker kind of um, left off, which is that, um, for, particularly for young activists coming into the movement today, I think there is a lot that is... That I think that intersectionality and privilege theory, in terms of focusing people on the reality of oppression, I think the contribution from the young comrade from Spain really summed it up. You know, that for a lot of people, in terms of what motivates them politically, isn't it, is that you see these horrible things happening to people and you think it's unjust and you want to fight against it. And that's a, that's a, that's a brilliant thing to want to be able to do. And that's what motivates a lot of people to fight. I, think, I do think there is a problem with the word privilege itself, though. Because I think the word privilege, I think it's a right for us all to be free from oppression, to not to have to suffer from harassment from the police or in the streets and so on and so forth. I don't think, I think the problem with the word privilege is that it implies that you somehow benefit from that oppression and therefore you have an interest in maintaining that oppression. And I don't think that is true. I don't think it's true that white workers have an interest in maintaining um, uh, uh, racism. I don't think it's true that men have an interest in maintaining women's oppression, I do think it's true that there are people who really are privileged in society. The people who sit in the, uh, the judges, the bosses of the multinational companies, the bankers, the Donald Trumps of this world, people are absolutely right. These people are ludicrously privileged. They live in literal golden palaces. They send their kids to completely different schools from the rest of us with all sorts of um, uh, um, um, advantages and so on. These people benefit from the oppression that weakens and divides our class. And therefore, they will always jump to the side of, uh, uh, of defending the status quo as against the others. And that's my problem with the word privilege. If what you simply mean is, I recognise that there are people who are oppressed who are, uh, in a way that I'm not, and I want to stand in solidarity with them, that's brilliant. But you don't need to use the word privilege in order to do that. And, and so I think, I think the comrade who spoke is absolutely right. It's not a question of saying, oh, you're using intersectionality and privilege, don't you understand the mistakes that you're making? But it's a matter of having a discussion about how we take things forward and how we actually practically build solidarity. Because what people are starting from, isn't it, is a desire to show solidarity. That's a brilliant thing. A desire to say, how do these things connect together? How do we change society? That's a brilliant thing. But what you then have to do is start to talk about how that actually happens, how we build solidarity, how that comes about through struggle, how, it, how successful struggle depends on centrally involving the power of the working class, how when the class fights, ideas start to break down um, and divisions start to break down um, within society and so on and so forth. And therefore, I think there's a large extent to which a number of the new activists have a lot of things to teach us about the way that you organise, about using social media, about the language that you use, about all sorts of things that people are taught. I think that's really, really good, and we all need to discuss and debate those things. I also think some of us have things to teach about what class struggle looks like, what the working class is, how, you, how strikes can win, because we're used to them using, we're, 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 we're used to them not spreading. How, how, do we do, you know, how, how, how do we do that? And I think that we don't do anybody any favours if we don't tackle the uh, 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 um, theories that are used to basically undermine that struggle. I don't think we do anybody favours if we do that. And therefore, I think the political discussions about what, as a grand theory, intersectionality and privilege theory mean are important discussions, are very important important discussions to have. Um, because otherwise, you get locked into a system that actually makes it very difficult for you to say, how do you break out of it? How do how how, um, 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 uh, how, how, how practically um, do we do, do do we show solidarity? So I think in many ways it's a question of direction of travel, isn't it? If you've got new people coming into the movement talking about intersectionality and privilege, it's because they want to 
fight oppression. They want to show solidarity. They want to change the system for good and get rid of oppression. And therefore, we have to have these discussions about how it happens. But I think there is a danger that what is also happening is that people who come from a Marxist tradition, who have got quite pessimistic about the low level of struggle, who've basically given up on the idea that we can fundamentally change the world, are looking to some of those theories as a kind of excuse to move away from class. So I think, in a way, it kind of depends on the direction of struggle and uh, on the direction of travel that people are going in and we have to be the ones that are pulling in the direction of reasserting the centrality of uh, uh, um, the the centrality of class within that discussion and of course um, Joe's absolutely right to raise the fact that it's not just now that um, class struggle involves a more vibrant a more diverse and so on and so forth class I mean I, you know when I was first starting to get interested in politics it was about the growth of the national front it was also about the Grunwick strike Grunwick strike was 1977 uh, um, Asian workers taking on um, uh, a big company. It became a really big strike, vicious picket lines, battles with the police and so on. And I'll tell you what, what let down that strike was not um, anything to do with a failure of intersectionality or privilege or anything like that. It was the cowardice of the trade union bureaucracy that refused to call on other workers to come out in solidarity with the Grunwick strikers. And the problem is, if you resort to buzzwords, you completely avoid that political discussion and you actually let people off the hook. We, we, we don't have a proper analysis of why we're not winning if we, if we simply resort to, um, to resort to buzzwords and moralism. And that's why these questions are important in, ter in, ter in terms of, um, um, in terms of, in, in terms of moving on. Uh, people have talked about ideas changing. I didn't really get the time to um, talk about that in, 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 in great detail. So I just want to finish with this. Um, Marx understood this, didn't he? There's a contradiction in what Marx said, isn't there? Because on the one hand, he said the emancipation of the working class is the act of the working class. But on the other hand, he said the ideas in society are the ideas of the ruling class. So there's a contradiction there. Our side is going to fight and emancipate itself but we, by and large, accept a lot of the rotten ideas that come down to us about the role of women, um, um, uh, uh, about um, how damaging immigrants are to the economy, about a whole number of things. And therefore, you have to say, how do we begin to challenge that? And the key is in the question of fighting back and, uh, uh, and struggle. And that was why, for Marx, the, the question of fighting and struggling, which we need more of, not less of, you know, these old things people talked about, these picket lines that a lot of people have never seen in their lifetime, we need more of them. We need more of this struggle. And the reason that Marx talked about it was partly, you know, people talked about ideas can be challenged in the process of that struggle. Again, you know, 30 years ago, it's a long time ago now, the 1984-85 miners' strike, a lot of people here might not remember it, but what happened during that strike, the beginning of that strike, when the women came out to support the miners, they would chant back at them, get your tits out for the lads. By the end of the strike, the women around the strike had set up these support groups where they were organising solidarity, they were speaking at public meetings, mass meetings, open air meetings in Trafalgar Square. You know, they were getting up and saying, oh my gosh, I've never done anything like this in my life. But people who before had been scared to open their mouths were getting up and speaking in front of thousands and thousands of people and actually the miners were forced to change their opinions. Those opinions were then challenged. And that was, a, that was a change that took place, that people who were, were involved in that strike, um, uh, uh, you know, as a student, uh, as a student, we were getting up at four in the morning, getting into the vans, going down to the picket lines in Yorkshire. You learn about the process of that struggle. And I think it's the lack of that struggle at the moment that is meaning that people are looking for all of these kinds of alternative ideas. We have to teach people that there is this history of struggle and that people can fight back and that ideas can change. And just finally, in terms of what Mark said, what's the conclusion of this? The conclusion of this is that we need an uprising, a revolutionary change in society that is based on that struggle and solidarity that forces people to challenge what Marx called the muck of ages that is in, your, that, that, that is in our heads. And this is how Marx put it in the German ideology. The revolution is necessary, therefore, not only because the ruling class cannot be overthrown in any other way, but also because the class overthrowing it can only in a revolution succeed in ridding itself of all of the muck of ages and become fitted to pound society anew. That is the project which we in the Socialist Workers' Party are in the process of building. Please join us and help us.